Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime, unsolved mysteries, missing people, urban legends, and the dark side of the Sunshine State. If you would like to support our show and get a bunch of extra Paradise After Dark content and my new show, True Crime Headlines content, early and ad-free episodes on both shows, sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. That's P-A-L-A-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. And be sure to visit our website at paradiseafterdark.com. On our website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, our mailing list, our social medias, and of course, our Patreon. And we also have a virtual tip jar on there. If you just want to help out the show and give us a little tip, that'd be great. Yep. And speaking of shout outs. Uh, we've got a couple. We have solved a mystery. We've solved the mystery. Of the public lady. Her name is Trish. Trish. So Trish, here is your formal shout out. It was a pleasure to meet you in public that day. And I'm glad to put a name with a face. You know what? I don't think anybody's, like, any random person has ever gotten this much attention on our show. No. All because she recognized you in Publix. It made me feel good. And said, dark, 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 dark. <laughs> Makes me feel good. <laughs> I know. Made me feel good. I know. Uh, speaking of other shout outs, we do have a shout out from Kelly, who donated to the tip jar from Terre Haute, Indiana. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. We love tips. We love tips. And another tip in the tip jar from Depew, Oklahoma. So somebody's living on Tulsa time. Linda, thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. So, Lauren. This week, we are discussing an endangered missing case. We are discussing the case of missing Diane Francis. So, Diane Francis was last seen by her daughters in Palm Beach, Florida, sometime in June 2003. This was the last time she was seen by her daughters. She was arrested for trespassing in Jacksonville, Florida on November 27th of 2005, and this is the last indication of her whereabouts. There's been no nothing, and I actually... We're going to get into this more later, but I've been in contact with Diane's daughter, Sherry, for probably close to a year and a half at this point, trying to get this episode together. And as we go forward, you'll understand why it took such a long time. But I just talked to Sherry the other day, and she said that she checked to see if her mother, Diane Francis, had collected on any of the stimulus checks that have been sent out. Ooh, that's an interesting fact. It is. And she has not gotten, collected any of the stimulus checks that have been sent out. No, it's not. So let's get into the story of Diane. She was born July 7th, 1968 in Somerville, New Jersey to Rosalie Lamonto and David Leslie Francis Sr., She has two younger brothers, David Leslie Francis Jr. and Michael J. Francis. Diane had a normal, happy childhood until her parents separated when she was about 12 years old. According to her daughter, Sherry, there is some speculation that she may or may not have experienced some physical or sexual abuse as a child, but nothing has been confirmed to date. When her parents divorced, Diane and her brothers moved to Florida with their father. This is when Diane's behavior started to change. Her brothers called their mother once and told her that Diane was sneaking boys into the house in the middle of the night. When she reached high school, she was described as drop-dead gorgeous and boys were constantly pursuing her. At this point, she began to drift far away from the once normal and well-behaved child she was. Her father recalls her, quote, getting in with the wrong crowd. I think all of us at some point in our life have been in with the wrong crowd. And some of us realize it quickly and some of us don't, sadly. So at the age of 16, Diane became pregnant. Now, she would later give birth to this baby prematurely in the hospital bathroom. Now, sadly, her baby girl, Stephanie Francis, was born and died on April 11th, 1985. Now, there are different accounts of Diane's reaction 
and behavior after the birth and death of her first daughter. Some say she never bounced back from it, and others say she was cold, callous, and didn't seem to care. But we all know grief is a funny thing, and you really can't judge anyone who's suffered such profound loss, especially at such a young age. 16, yeah, you're not I even, can't. You're still a child at, at that yeah, time, too. Yeah, I can't so. even imagine. Now, the details are unclear, but at some point, Diane moved back to New Jersey, and we are not certain if this was before or after she dropped out of high school in the 12th grade. Now, in the year 1990, Diane met Charles Edward Snyder. A year after they met, their first daughter, Jessica, was born September 22nd, 1991. And on June 15th, 1983, they welcomed another daughter, Sherry. Now, according to Charles Snyder, at some point between the two pregnancies, Sherry started doing a lot of drugs and partying as well as cheating on him and not coming home some nights. He even claimed she did drugs while pregnant with Sherry. Now, these claims are not confirmed. They are what was told to Sherry by her father. Now, the couple would continue to live in New Jersey, moving there in order to make ends meet, staying with family whenever possible. Eventually, they would end up in the state of Florida again in the year 1994. Diane said she wanted to be near her father again. Just one year after their move to the state of Florida, they end up in a trailer park where Diane met a man by the name of John Schmidt. She told Charles, I'm going to marry John and he's going to be the girl's father now. Charles then moved back to New Jersey to be back with his family and his daughters never saw him again. Diane continued down the same path dating different men, and there was always drugs involved. Her daughters were taken by social services and put into foster care at least three times over the next several years. The girls were also shuffled around to other family members, everyone just waiting for Diane to get it together enough to raise them herself. But unfortunately, that never happened. Yeah, it's a once you're in the realm of that scenario, it's tough. You can't get out of it. It's kind of like being arrested. It's like a vicious cycle. Exactly. It's like once you're in the system, you're always in the system. It's tough to get out. You can't break the cycle. Yeah. It's always a tough scenario. And so. Yeah. And I've seen it and I've had even family members go down that path and that's just. Yeah. And if you've got an addictive personality, it's tough because the the opportunity seems to always present itself when you see certain people. Right. So you, you literally have to like go somewhere where no one knows you to like try sometimes. It makes it a little tougher. Well, Diane eventually met John Taylor Boggs. Now, this was the day he got out of prison in 1997. Now, Boggs had served four years in prison for burglary, and the relationship was volatile, to say the least. Sherry remembers one night in 1999 when Boggs threw Diane across the house and then punched a hole through a door trying to get to her. And then Sherry and her sister began jumping on him, kicking and screaming to try and help their mother. Diane would later deny all of this abuse to the police, and she wanted to continue on as if nothing happened so she could keep her place to live, mostly for her daughter's sake. I get it. It's tough. Yeah. It's really tough. But not long after, she lost her daughters again, and this time she tried to take her own life. Despite the abuse, the drugs, the drama, Diane and John Boggs were very much in love with each other. And Sherry remembers times they had that were good together, and she even claimed that it wasn't horrible 100% of the time. Yeah, she described it to me that there there was good times, and it wasn't 100% horrible, but there was some dark times as well yeah. during this time period. But in the year 2000, Diane met a man named Roger Allen Foreman Sr., Roger was driving down the road one day and spotted Diane on the side of the road walking. He stopped to speak to her. She told him she had just gotten into a huge fight with her crazy boyfriend, John Boggs, and she explained that she did not want to go back home to him. That was the beginning of their relationship right then and there, Diane and Roger. Roger was good for Diane. Soon she was allowed to see her daughters again, mostly on arranged, supervised visits, and soon after she regained custody of them. She seemed happy, always joking, almost back to her normal self. But that didn't last, unfortunately. In 2003, Diane lost her girls for the last time, again for drugs and neglect. 
Her parental rights were terminated and her daughters never saw her face to face again. At the time of her disappearance, she was living a transient lifestyle, what many of the missing person flyers and websites call high risk. Although her last arrest was in Jacksonville, she was known to spend time in Southeast Florida. Her most recent addresses were in Melbourne and Palm Bay. At some point in 2006, the, the actual date is unknown, she called her father asking for her birth certificate and social security card. Now, she asked him to mail the documents to a hotel in Jacksonville, which he did. So her father complied, sent it to her. But when he tried to contact her again later on, she was gone. So at this point, we know she was in Jacksonville in 2006. And as far as we know, this is the last contact she had with any of her family. And her daughters have since hired a private investigator to look for Diane, but he wasn't able to come up with anything. So Diane was 37 at the time of her disappearance, but she would be 52 today. Her hair has been described as blonde or brown or strawberry blonde. And the last time she was seen, it was shoulder length and straight. Her eyes are brown or hazel. She's five foot three inches tall and 100 to 120 pounds. She has a tattoo of a heart on her left calf and a tattoo of the letters JT on her right arm and her ears are pierced. She has scars on both arms and on her face. She has a space between her two upper front teeth where the teeth turn away from each other. According to the Charlie Project, she may go by her middle name, Teresa, or use the alias names Diane Teresa Foreman and or Kimberly Teresa Foreman, and she has used uh, nicknames like Kimmy or Dee Dee in the past. Well, situations like this, you kind of just hope it's, it, you pray when you hear these missing cases that are so old. And like you had said that there's, you know, the stimulus checks were never submitted, cash, whatever, that it's kind of that fugue state that we talked about mm -hmm. with uh, Hannah Up, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, you just pray you for You hope that. that that's the case. Exactly. That the person that she's out there somewhere, she just doesn't know. And at some point it clicks or she checks back into reality or something. But either way, uh, that's kind of what you hope for. So we, we, and by we, I say Lauren had the pleasure to speak to Diane's daughter, Sherry. And so let's go ahead and let Sherry tell you a little bit about her mother. Yeah, we're going to play the interview for you now. Okay, and now we have Sherry, Diane Francis's daughter with us. Hi, Sherry. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on the show and trusting us to help tell your mom's story. One thing I want to tell you right off the bat is that there's not a lot of info out there about your mom. I mean, for the average person just Googling it, wanting to find out more information about her disappearance. I know that there's a, there's a ton of info that you sent me uh, that you have, but sure. I've just found just skimming the surface. There's not much out there, which is one of the reasons why it's great that we have you to talk to, to answer our questions. Right. So touching on that a little bit, um, basically the only reason I could see, you know, there not being too much public information is this is a fairly new case. And I want to explain that a little bit because it's not a new case. It is a cold right. case, but it is newly reported. So there right. wasn't a, there was an attempt to make in a report in 2015, but she didn't actually get reported until about two years ago by me. And I had to use an out of county detective to get that report taken even um, just jumping through hoops of fire to try and get it done. And that's really why nothing comes up just on a, on a regular Google search or, or something like that. All the reports I have, it was my legal right to have those things because I am biologically related to her. If you aren't, you can't get a hold of those documentations unless you, of course, know me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's just to explain that a little bit. Um, yeah, it's I didn't get out of foster care until 2010. And like I, I say in all my reports and stuff, I asked my family 
what had happened to her, but they didn't know. And so I took it upon myself in 2010 to start my search there, basically hitting a stone wall with the family. I turned to the public for help, basically. And so that's where we're at now. 11 years you've been searching for your mom. Yep. Actively searching. Yeah. And even prior to that, it's illegal to search for your bio family in foster care. Once there's been a TPR, which is termination of parental rights, you're no longer allowed to make contact until you are uh, no longer a minor. So the age of 18. And again, that happened for me in 2010. So I couldn't legally start my search until 2010. And even prior, I, I still did. I would sneak on the computer steal the phone any chance I had, you know, in school, I would just try and sneak away to the library so I could research, do whatever I could. But again, it was, it was hard and I usually got caught and in a lot of trouble for it. So, um, yeah, again, my, my official start to my search didn't start until 2010. So, so let me ask real quick, when was the last time you actually saw your mother? I last physically saw my mother in 2003 two years before she disappeared. Okay. But had you talked to her after that or had any contact with her? The circumstances of that are, so basically we were taken from my mother three times. First time I was four, second time I was six or seven, the last time I was nine or 10. And so the nine or 10 scenario would be 2003. I didn't actually see my mother in 2003. I heard her by phone court appearance. She refused to show up at the court as well as my father. So they both appeared by phone to terminate their parental rights. Um, A few months later, after we were placed in a temporary home, a package showed up and it was said to be sent by my mother. And it had my sister and I's favorite clothes, our favorite shoes, stuff from home. And Um, also in the back of one of my sister's pairs of jeans, there was a folded up letter. Like, I don't know if you remember in middle or high school, we used to fold these letters like into these little, uh, squares, but it like, it was like almost origami kind of. Yes. Yes. I do. (laughs) I do remember that. (laughs) She folded exactly like that and wrote to my girls from mom. And it just, it was a letter stating that this isn't the end. It's not over. I will be back for you. Just like I have every time this has happened. Um, don't lose hope, things like that. There's this one saying that I always repeat from her just because it's kind of really beautiful. Um, Just that when you look at the moon, I see the same moon. When you look at the stars, I see the same stars. So that means we could never be too far apart. And, um, you know, just just little things like that. So I never saw my mom after that uh, court hearing, but we did get that little package from her, which is kind of like a parting gift per se. Um, of course, Jessica and I were convinced we'd see her again because she did always come back. You know, that was the third time. So to us, it was like, okay, we'll see her again, you know, um, but we didn't, that was the last time. And then there's the alleged phone call in 2006 to her father's household, um, which Rita, my step grandmother answered the phone. So that's the context of that whole, I don't know if you've seen that where it says, um, I act, that's actually on my list of questions uh tell us about that phone call in 2006 like what what's up with that what's the story about behind that so when my mom was about 12 or 13 years old her parents split up I know that's a known thing it's it's spoken about and so uh, my grandfather which is my mother's father got with another woman named Rita Rita Cook and you'll see her mentioned in some reports and things like that Um, She was like a grandmother to me growing up. I never met my biological grandmother, but a couple times as a little uh, infant. And so Rita stepped in as our grandmother and even my uncles call her mom, you know, like she's, she's incorporated in the family. Now they moved to Florida together shortly after getting together. And that's how Florida became incorporated in my mom's life. But um, once they moved to Florida, they kind of split in a sense, but they stayed in the same home. So I've always known them to sleep in separate bedrooms, Rita on one side of the house and my grandfather on the other side of the house. It's been like that for as long as we can remember. (laughs) It's just how it is. And so 
the circumstances of my mother's phone call, uh, the reason I'm explaining that is because when she called their house, Rita answered. And so she had to run to my grandfather's bedroom door and bang on the door and say, Diane is on the phone. So from what I've heard and what I've gathered from the family, my grandfather opens the door, looks at Rita and asks her, is she sober? And Rita said, no. And he said, well, then I don't want to talk to her. And apparently she asked for some, um, like her social security card and birth certificate and things like that. I'm not sure why. I can only assume to either collect government assistance, to move out of state, you know, whatever you might need your identity for, um, purchasing something large, things like that. So apparently he says he sent it to her, but that when he called the hotel back, this was the same hotel that was mentioned in those reports as well on Cagle Road or Craigle Road, Cagle Road in Jacksonville. Uh, he said the the hotel was shut down when he called back in order to try and figure out why she was calling or, you know, see how she was doing, what have you. The so shut down. How do you know how much time had passed between the time he mailed the documents and the time he called? He said like six months. And it, I so with my detective brain, I have gone on Google for numerous amount of hours, just looking on Google Maps, trying to see what's up with this hotel. And so what I've come to the conclusion is that around that time period, when the hotel got closed down, something bad happened. I'm not sure what, I can't prove it. I can't find any documentation. I'm not a law enforcement officer. I don't know how to do that. But you can tell that they completely shut down the hotel at that time period. Everyone got kicked out of every room and they changed the name of the hotel. They didn't change the carpet in the rooms. They didn't change the beds. They didn't change anything else other than throwing a tarp over the sign on the road that says Econo Lodge. So it's no longer a Ramada Inn. It's now an Econo Lodge. And I've gathered a rumor about the new hotel and apparently the same likes of people hang out there. And it was not a great hotel when my mother was going there. It was known for bad things. So it makes you think something bad happened. I just don't see why they would close down the hotel and immediately throw a sign over, you know, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it was a little creepy to me that right at that time period where she disappeared and was being caught for prostitution in that hotel, they shut it all down and changed the name of the hotel, but didn't even clean the carpets or anything on the inside. It's literally just the same exact hotel. You know what I mean? I don't know. I may just be crazy, but it seems odd to me. And like I said, I spoke to the security officer. I don't know if I told you that. I contacted the security officer that actually maced my mother in one of those reports. No, I Uh, don't think you told me about that. No. Yes. So I texted him um, and he wrote me back, but he claims he doesn't remember. He doesn't remember. He hasn't. He said, I haven't been over there since 2006 when all that stuff happened. That's all he said. And then he would never answer me again. I said, what stuff? And he didn't he didn't clarify. So I just kind of was all like, OK, happened. That's that's ominous. Right. That's ominous and statement. not to mention my mom's like 90 pounds soaking wet and she put up a heck of a fight with these two officers. Yeah. They maced her, detained her until police got there, and then she refused medical help. Like, you don't remember that? Right. How many times has that happened to you in your career? Seven or one? Because, <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> that's yeah. just my, I wasn't, I didn't say that to him, of course, but, you know, that's just my feelings on it, I guess. Uh, right. I know if I maced a little woman and, you know, was holding her down on the ground outside a hotel, I'd probably remember it. <laughs> Who knows? Okay, we know that she was arrested in November of 2005 in Jacksonville, and that was at the hotel, correct? Yes, that's actually the instance I'm speaking of, I believe, is where she she was detained. Yeah. So that was the last quote unquote official sighting of your mother. And right, other than other than when she was released, but we don't know how to obtain video. Like if the if the jail has video of her leaving, we don't know how to get that as of now. So I wonder if they would even still have it at this point. Right. I was, I've definitely run into some record retention excuses. So I see that being a factor. For right. Sure. 
so then 2005 was the last official sighting and then there was a phone call in 2006 but what's up with the ex-boyfriend who reported her missing in 2015 10 years later can we get into that a little bit oh we can (laughs) because that's the part that really is like it, it I can't, I'm having a really hard time wrapping my head around that. I know. And I've read, I've read everything you sent me and I'm still just like, what? Yes. Um, So this individual was someone who actually dated my mother from like 1997 to 1999. So just like two years, you know, way back when, 16 years ago. And then, um, so I was living in, in Melbourne, Florida at the time. It was like 2014. And I had my sister come out to where I was staying because she lived about three hours from me. And we made some flyers and things like that and went to all the old houses we used to live in and this and that. And so like a couple of years later, I'm talking to the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and they're like, because, you know, mind you, I called there over and over trying to get this report taken and they would not do it. I called on my birthday crying hysterically. They laughed at me like I... I tried everything. So then one time I get this kind person on the phone, finally, after like 16 people that just didn't care at all, this woman gets on and she's like, so I'm seeing here that there's a report from 2015. If you can tell me what that's about, I can release the rest of the information about the report to you. And I said, 2015, mind you, like I haven't seen anything on my mom other than like 2005 and prior. So I'm like 2015, I'm like, racking my brain trying to figure out what this report could be and you know related to and she she gave me the first name and she said do you know a so-and-so and i said immediately said his last name and she said yes that's it and started reading off the report from 2015 from the ex-boyfriend and i was like what is this what is going on like i it was just blowing my mind i'm like what do you mean he tried to report her missing 16 years after seeing her last and you guys just took it and she goes oh no we didn't take the report it was open for about 30 minutes and then they closed it out and i'm like and i'm like what so and like mind you their law enforcement they can see that this person was my mother's abuser he used to beat the living daylights out of my mother in front of my sister and i And we used to jump on him and scream and try and get him off of her and try and help her. And then 16 years later, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm worried about her. So, oh, and I'm the stepfather of her kids. So I just decided to call in to see, you know, what was going on. Why? Why? Yeah, like nowhere ever. Nowhere ever is that normal. No, No. I'm sorry. No, you're right. Like, I can't, like I said, I can't wrap my head around now, was it, what else was going on in his life at that time, though? So, yeah, that was the next thing I was going to um, get at. So there's actually three missing individuals associated with this person that I've found. Um, there's my mother, of course, who is the ex-girlfriend of this person. And then there is George Contos who is the neighbor and friend of this person. I even have a news, like a little news article where he speaks about George Contos going missing. Um, And mind you, George Contos went missing May 11th, I believe was the day his report was made, or May 10th. And then my mother is just a day apart from him. Did now did he report his neighbor slash friend missing or did somebody else report him? Missing? No, the family did. But when the new like when the news station and police came to investigate in the neighborhood, he was somebody that spoke up on behalf of George saying, like, I don't know why anyone would ever want to hurt him. Um, I hope he's OK. And he's never still, been found. No, he's still not found. They found his truck near the Everglades. And another thing I I. Again, we're not mentioning names, so I guess I could <laughs> say this. I've spoken to him on the phone in the last year and a half, and he was not worried about what happened to George Contos. He told me, oh, I know what happened to him. They fed him to the gators. Who's they? He didn't say. He just said they. And I said, who? and I think I said that, too. I said, who's they? And he said, you know, the drug dealers. And I said, no, I don't know, <laughs> actually. Um But yeah, no proof on that because I never, I didn't have a recording device on my phone at that time. I mean, I've just gotten really, you know, 
kind of good at this. It's all new to me too, but I have some voicemails I recorded from him that I'll keep forever probably just because they're creepy. Um, so, and then again, that's George Contos. So that was the neighbor. He lived right next to this person pretty much four or five houses down and he goes missing. And then the next day, this person reports my mom missing or tries to, I guess. So just one day difference there. And then I'm, I'm going through this person's page on social media and I'm, I'm looking and looking for family because mind you, he stopped talking to me a year ago also, just vanished off the face of the planet. He's not deceased. He's not in jail. He's just ignoring me. Um, he blocked my sister. So I think he knows I am suspicious. I don't really know what he thinks, but again, I have no solid evidence. I'm just going through ideas here, but um, scrolling through his page, looking for family to see if I could contact someone to, to make sure he's okay. You know, I haven't heard from him in a year now. And some of his friends were posting on his page like, hey, are you okay? I haven't heard from you. I sent you a birthday card a month ago. What's going on? Nothing. So I'm scrolling through his stuff and I see this girl named Jess. And I'm like, hmm, I know he has a daughter named Jessica. So I thought that that was her. And I click on this Jess girl and all over her Facebook is her mother who is missing. And her name's Sherry Campbell. So again, there's another association, Sherry and Jessica. Those names are familiar. Um, and to me, Wait it's just minute, Your odd. sister's name is Jessica, right? Yes. Okay. So the fact that he, he's got a Sherry and a Jessica on his page and there's a missing person involved in that scenario just threw me off. I was like, whoa, what is going on? There's a whole nother missing person attached to him. And... Yeah. Like I explained to you and, and I tell everyone, I have one missing person involved in my life. That is one too many, okay? This person now has three missing people involved in their life. That's three too many. Like, I just, I don't know how obvious things have to be, but like nobody listened to me for a very long time with the associations. They just thought I was nuts. They were like, who cares? You know, like what difference does it make? But to me, right. it's just, all too coincidental. I, I too many coincidences, and now you got my attention, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's just a thing that I. <laughs> that's just a factor of the case that I kind of go back and. It's like poking the bear, you know, like poke it, and then you go away for a while, and then you come back and poke it, and then you <laughs> go away for a while, and then you find more evidence, come back and poke it. I'm getting yeah. there, but I just don't exactly know where I'm getting to. If that makes any sense. <laughs> I don't right. know if it leads anywhere. I, you know, I hope it doesn't for his sake and everyone's sake involved, but I'm not going to just ignore the numerous coincidences. Like I said, that's, that's really where that's at. So when he said that his neighbor was fed to alligators by the drug dealers, was your mom on drugs? Was she involved with drug dealers? Um, yes. My mom was a drug addict and she was a, also a prostitute, um, which again, no factual information, but I've heard that this person does dabble in the prostitution side of things where he lives. So, um, and not in a good way. So when I, when I think of this, just my, this, is where my mind goes, just at doing this for four years, my mind goes to trafficking or drug related something you know what i mean like what do you have any theories like what in all of your investigating which girl you have got a lot of information <laughs> i mean i gotta <laughs> give you props for everything that you sent me i was like overwhelmed i was like holy cow how'd she get all this information <laughs> Usually I tell people like, so I'm going to send the first three and then let me know when you get through that. And then I'll send you three <laughs> more and then let me know when you, cause it's just like, you send it and it's all just like, boom, here you go. Like, yeah. Wanted it's, the case. There it is. Like you should, um, you should go to school and be a private investigator or something. I think you'd be probably. good at it. <laughs> so what do you, 
think happened? I mean, if you had to give a theory, what do you think may have happened to your mom? Well, I'd like to say I don't have one set theory. And it's basically because the three theories that I have are kind of becoming one if that makes any sense so she has an ex-boyfriend over here who i think might have something to do with it she has an ex-boyfriend over here that i think might have something to do with it one of the sons might be involved it all has to do with drugs and uh, sex trafficking but i think maybe as a whole these people might have had something to do with it as well um i think it's very possible that she could have been continuing her drug addiction with friends or you know a boyfriend i guess i would call it um and could have possibly overdosed and maybe somebody just doesn't want to say anything that's definitely a possibility with transient drug addiction you know like they go hand in hand and like people passing and the transient camp doesn't want to say anything that kind of thing you know um i definitely think it had to do with sex trafficking because that's where she she was when we last see her you know what I mean? She's still in the hotels. She's naming this person that's with her in the hotel as a husband, but clearly he's not because she was never legally married. So I'm thinking of it as a John. It could have been a John she was in a hotel room with. Or um, it could have been a trafficker. A trafficker. Right. Like a John is like a pimp, maybe, you know, or like a, like her, I don't know what you would even call it. I don't do that. So I can't, yeah. I don't know the term, but um. Yeah, something like that, you know, if if the law kept showing up, because here's another thing, that hotel room where they trespassed her last, they said that there was a, the order of trespassing was posted right on the wall behind her. And she was saying she, she didn't know that she wasn't allowed to be there. So she had been trespassed from this room already before and was saying that it was her husband's room. So if your husband's in this hotel and you get arrested, why did he not come get you? You know, or like, where did you guys go after that? Or like, where's the record of you going back to the hotel when you got out? I just, to me, it's like stuff ended at that hotel. And I don't know if it was with the, the guy she was with or if it was lo with law enforcement or what. But it seems like after that hotel in November 2005, she's nowhere to be found. And it was like, she just kept going back there. So why all of a sudden did you stop? That's my thing, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So there's a very real possibility that your mom was being trafficked at that time in 2005. And I know that that's 2005 is what, 16 years ago, mm -hmm. human trafficking wasn't really a thing. I mean, it wasn't as well known as it is now, but do you think that that could be what was happening with her? I really do believe so. Um, because prior to this occurrence in November 2005 at the hotel, she had a couple reports of her being in the trailer park, like right next to this hotel, which was not even a mile away. So still in the same exact area. And she was found street walking. Someone reported her probably like a peeping Tom looking out their window. They just called it in and said, mm -hmm. you know, there's someone walking very provocatively down the road here. Um, and so she was apprehended for that but was let go because they couldn't prove anything. Um, and then there was another one where she's in the same trailer park with her pants down, urinating or something like that. So, and then there was another report from that same neighborhood. She's like in front of a church throwing beer bottles or something. So she stayed in that same general area until November, 2005. So to me, it's like someone took you from there and took you somewhere else, or you took yourself away from there and went somewhere else. Because well, after 2005, you're just gone from that area. So. Well, and that's my, what's, that's one of my thoughts when I come to the trafficking theory is that women are moved around, all, around the whole country, even around the world. Great. If they are, you know, being held against their will or being held by drugs or you know i know a lot of times they'll they'll get the women addicted to drugs and then they'll feed them the drugs so the women won't go anywhere because they have to come back for the drugs okay so we have 
the theory that she was possibly trafficked. But then there's also the abusive boyfriend who randomly reported her missing in 2015, who's also connected to two other missing people. Mm -hmm. Then I have a thought. What, uh, What if she got her social security card and birth certificate so she could disappear herself? That's always been a thought to, um, because as you've probably all seen, there is a alias that pops up right in the 2004, 2005 area. So it's almost as if maybe she knew that my sister and I might be getting out soon and didn't want to be found. Um, that's definitely been mentioned a few times in the past. You know, what if she doesn't want to be found? And right. mind you, that's clearly possible, but it is up to me to find her for my own good and her own good before she does pass if she is still out there. You know what I mean? Because that's a missed opportunity that you don't get back. And I would hate to see her pass of old age or something and not ever have contact with my sister and I again. I couldn't see her doing that either. Like, I feel like death brings a lot out of people that they wouldn't normally do or say. And I could see her, you know, growing old and wanting her family around because she knows it is um, her time to pass or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. I'm not sure, but I couldn't see myself dying and not contacting my kids or like, you know, getting ill and not contacting my kids or whatever. Right. There's also, there's also the factor people mention like, so schizophrenia runs in my family heavily. Her youngest brother has it severely. I advise the public not to look into him too much because he just needs to be left alone. But um, her other brother just recently found out he's had an aneurysm since he was a child or something like that. Her younger brother has schizophrenia, has had heart problems since he was nine years old. So there's a lot of health issues in my family and her being 53 now, I could see a lot of that catching up with her. Mm -hmm. And who's to say she's not in like a mental facility and just doesn't even know who she is anymore. Like, we don't know. We don't know. And I don't have the legal ability to find that information if she was in like a medical, you know, facility for in the insane. I don't know that they would even release it because of HIPAA laws. Right. It would be her decision. And I'm assuming if she doesn't even know who she is anymore, her decision would be no. So (laughs) um, there's always that possibility. You know, you see stuff on on Discovery Channel or whatever all the time about how, oh, this woman woke up one day. She's 67 and she remembered she has six kids and they live on the other side of the country. And she bumped her head one day and lost her memory. Like, you know, stuff like that happens. And there's always a possibility. It's more unlikely than what I'm facing, but it's definitely considered in the back of my mind. Well, maybe, I mean, there's always the possibility it what it may not be that, that she didn't want to be found by you. Maybe she got herself into a bad situation and she just needed to disappear and get away from it. Yeah. I That's, mean, her whole life was a bad situation. So have you given DNA? So I have sent my DNA with uh, Ancestry and we've done that. So the only match that came back on that also is my grandfather, which of course he popped up right away. He's like 2000 CMs or whatever it is. So he's like the highest match I have. Everyone else is like fourth cousin, fifth cousin, you know, twice removed. Yeah. From your other half of your family or whatever. But so then I did um, DNA with Detective John Cogburn as well. And so that is being sent or was sent to the University of North Texas to be cross-matched against all Jane Doe's in the NCIC system. So that based basically like any Jane Doe that pops up, there's one in Orlando that I've been interested in for years. The DNA is pending on that one. Um, I'm not sure if it's pending because of me or if it's pending because of someone else, but it's pending. And then there's a couple in Palm Beach County where Cogburn is actually where his home station is. Um, And that's actually how we got the report taken is I found a a Jane Doe that matched my mother's description and contacted Cogburn because he was the detective with that or, you know, connected to that Jane Doe. 
and he just basically heard my story and felt (laughs) felt for me and said that he would take it even though my mom's not from palm beach and we don't know her to be in palm beach we believe she could have gone there at some point because my sister and i lived there so that's how cogburn is involved but um basically just waiting on that dna there like i said there's no like periodic updates on that. It's just like the last time I heard from him was probably six months ago on it. And it was just to send me the confirmation letter that they had received my DNA. And then, like I said, today today I messaged him just to let him know that I had found an update on something and he said he would look into it. So that's the DNA scenario. Nothing solid yet. Yeah, and that unfortunately that can take a long time too. Yeah. I mean, it took a year of just a little over a year to get the uh, letter that University of North Texas had received my DNA and we're going to start processing it into the system to be compared. Um, Because I sent it June 15th, 2020, I think. Uh, It was my birthday. (laughs) And then my birthday just passed again. So it's been just over a year. Yeah. So where are some other places that you can think of that your mother may have gone? I mean, we know she had ties to Jacksonville. We know she had ties to Palm Beach. Is there any other, even if it's not in Florida, any other places where she may have family or friends or she may have gone that you can think of, that you know of? Yes. So she was born in New Jersey. So that's always going to be a factor. She could always go back there. Um, you know, I've had her high school friends contact me from there when they found out she was missing and just poured their hearts out to me about how wonderful she was and growing up with her and just cute little stories. So New Jersey is always a possibility. She had run away to California as like a 17 year old to be with this boy, I guess. And she had written her dad some letters while she was there. Um, and so I have copies of those as proof that she ran away to California Um, But I don't know. Again, that was just like some guy wanted to take her there. And so she went with him. I don't think she knew anyone there. She was there for him alone kind of thing. Um, But but again, you never know. Maybe they rekindled. Who knows? I don't know. (laughs) So California. (laughs) And then um, her mother actually lives in Illinois currently. So I just always keep that as an open option because I know I would want to be wherever my mother is. So maybe she has that feeling too. Who knows? But yeah, her mom's the only one that lives there really in Illinois. Have you spoken to her mother at all about her missing? Yes. So I've spoken to her mother a few times. We're currently not speaking um, just because she, I don't know if she's just so hurt by all of it that she tends to take it out on me sometimes but she left me this voicemail basically stating that she knows I'm talking to my mom and like like I would do that behind her back or something I never would do that if I found Diane the first person I would call is both her parents and my sister but Rose no longer speaks to me because she believes I'm speaking to my mother somehow (laughs) um But prior to that, yes, we've spoken. She just says that basically she tried to um, use this letter forwarding service, I guess. Social Security used to have a letter forwarding service that if you didn't know someone's address, you could send a letter there and they would get it to the person for you. And they stopped doing it in 2005, I think, or 2006. But um, she says she tried to do that. And that during the time of my mom's disappearance, her and her husband were going through a lot of medical issues and things, and they were also moving states. They were moving from Jersey to Illinois um, to be closer to better doctors for her husband, Dominic. And she missed a phone call in 2006, probably around the same time she called my grandfather. She called her mom and her dad usually around the same time. So my grandmother, I guess, missed the call and only found out about it through phone records or something like that. She saw my mom's number pop up on there and realized that she had missed a call after moving out of state. Um, And so they never spoke again. She never tells me if she tried after that or if that was it. 
if she just gave up at that point i don't know but that's the last like known occurrence between my grandmother and mother oh so this is such a puzzling situation it's almost just like she just vanished off the face of the earth oh i did want to mention uh speaking of theories we're talking about theories one of Uh the theories i have that i don't always mention basically when my sister and i got out of foster care we were placed in relative placement so that's that was in like 2008 we were placed with joanne you saw joanne mentioned on there right she's my aunt i guess but she's divorced out of the family so i don't know how that works if she's still my aunt she's the mother of my cousins so we'll just we'll okay. leave it at that. She's your, <laughs> um, she's your aunt. Right. She was the one that took us in like 1996, too. It's in some of those reports. Um, she was married to my uncle David, which is my mom's brother. So we got out. Joanne took us in 2008. So we actually got to ask our family in 2008 what happened to my mom. We didn't officially get to start searching until 2010. But 2008, we asked them. And they say, oh, I don't know. She called a couple years ago on Thanksgiving. That was the last time we ever heard from her. And I said, you didn't think to ask her where she was or like if she was okay or if she wanted to see us when we got out or, you know, you didn't like, oh, no, we had some cop friends look for her, but they didn't find anything. So like, so what you just gave up or was I like my thing is like that. So like what comes after that? So did you just give up? Was was that it for you? You were just so wore out with it that you were just done and you ended it right there? Or was there more and you just don't want to tell us? Like sometimes I feel a theory I have is that my family knows what happened to her, but it's just so hurtful that they don't want to tell Jessica and I, that they think they're protecting us from something. Um, but, you know, nine times out of 10, I just kind of squash that theory because I don't know if they would ever do I couldn't see them ever really doing that and dragging it out for 16 years you know what i mean like that's that's a long lie <laughs> but really i long- mean if something happened to her there would be like if she had passed or a drug overdose or murder or whatever the case may be there would be some documentation there would be a death certificate there would be a police report or you know something along those lines don't you think right um now i don't know the laws and everything like that i don't even know if this is a possibility i might just be some crazy white lady making stuff up but (laughs) i feel that if your two grandchildren just let's put it in this perspective or my two grandchildren even either of our grandchildren went into foster care for their entire lives and their mother just kept coming back, kept dredging it up, kept making stuff worse, kept stressing everybody out, kept going through rehab, kept getting the kids back, you know, this, that, and the other. And then the kids get out of foster care in 2008 and the mother has died in some awful manner or is just involved in some horrible stuff. I feel like me as a parent or, you know, as a grandparent of these children, I would be able to seal those records until I feel like they're old enough to see stuff like that. Does that make any sense? I don't know if that's possible, but I've heard that my grandpa has the legal ability to do that or her mother. I don't know. And that might be something that I actually might dig into before I put this entire episode together. You know what I mean? That's what it's been in the back of my brain. Like, could they do that? Because I feel like I could do that for my kid. That happened to my son. You know what I mean? I know he's only three right now. But if he was like 37 and something happened, I feel like as his mother, I'd be able to say, no, that's not information for everybody to find out. That's my information. And when I'm ready to give it, I will. I don't know. Yeah, I don't I don't know about that, though. I don't know about the law specifically. Um, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because I've been searching for a death certificate from New Jersey for like a year now and I can't find it. So maybe. (laughs) Well, and also there's, there's always the factor of it being unsolved. You know, it's a known thing with cold unsolved cases that they don't release information on purpose or they don't let those records be revealed on purpose because they want the 
offender to come forward with information they haven't released yet. Does that make right. sense? Like, yeah, yeah, that is a very well known tactic of law. Enforcement. Right. Like we didn't tell anyone that this person was stabbed with scissors and you knew that it was scissors. So it must have been you. Like, right. Exactly. Stuff like that. So I could see that being a thing. I don't know how records work. Of course, like I said, I'm not in law enforcement, but I've dug up as much as I physically and legally can so far. And I haven't found anything. Which is a lot. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Yes, I've tried. So is there anything else that you want the world to know about your mom or any information you want to put out there that may help anyone who might be listening, anyone particularly in the Jacksonville area that was there in the 2005, 2006 timeframe or Palm Beach area? Like, is there anything you can think of that you would want to put out there? Like identifying information or just any information? <laughs> any, anything. You can say whatever you want. I mean, I, what do you mean by identifying information? Like I already I'm just have like, your mom's description, which I'm going to put in. <laughs> I'm going to put okay. it in the episode. <laughs> no, I was just like, I'm looking at this little tiny photo of her. And she just looks so funny um, in her little AVs get up. <laughs> and so I was like, do you mean identifying things? Cause she's just, she was just that tube sock girl. I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, she was always in like sports bras and Daisy Duke. She always had jewelry all on her. I mean, she always hung with the tough crowd. So I'm sure you could, if she's around, you could probably find her there. That's about it. Honestly, she's just worth finding. That's all I want people to know. And if you have a loved one that people are telling you like, oh, she was just a prostitute or she was just a drug addict. And so yeah. does that mean that people shouldn't look for her? Or, you know, I just, sometimes I feel like People with missing individuals in their lives or missing family members, missing loved ones, friends, they feel like they should give up because, you know, the person has a bad history. Like I'm putting my mom's whole stuff out there. And honestly, people knew who she was, so I'm not afraid. And I think everyone should just keep moving forward, no matter the discouragement, you'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Everybody's worth finding. Everybody's life is worth something, no matter what they did. We've done we've done several cases where the victim, you know, wasn't exactly a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout, but it's still worth our time and effort to try and find them or to, to get justice for them, whichever the case may be. That's my right. theory on situations like that. Yeah, definitely. I don't think I have any more questions. If there's nothing else that you want to put out there. Yeah, that was, that's it for me. I'm very thankful for the opportunity. Well, Sherry, I really want to thank you for talking to me and again, trusting us at paradise after dark to tell your mom's story. And we hope that we, our episode can, you know, help keep it, in the forefront, keep it in people's minds. That's our goal always is to just keep, keep it going, you know? And right. um, again, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you guys so much. So, and I guess that's going to be it for tonight then. Again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk media. Go ahead and check out our website for links to all of our social media, uh, our merch store. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening on and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And thank you, everyone, for listening tonight. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.